Welcome to another episode of Discovering the Jewish Roots. I'm Dr. Rick Wange, and as you know, this is the third week we've been going through the Haftorah sections uh, of the prophets, and these are the sections that match the Torah portions. This week is Lek Leka, which means go forth in Hebrew. This comes to us from Isaiah the prophet, chapter 40, verse 27, through chapter 41, verse 16. I'm just going to read the beginning of this, and then we're going to cover some of this in depth. It starts off this way. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Yerushalayim and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins, a voice of one calling, in the desert prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God, Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken, a voice says, Cry out! And I said, What shall I cry? All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. And of course, it continues through chapter 41. Well, it's now around 700 BCE, before the Common Era, and King Hezekiah, he's become extremely ill, actually to the point of death. And the prophet Isaiah, Yeshayahu in Hebrew, came to him and he told him to prepare for meeting God. With this news, King Hezekiah cries out to God for mercy. Miraculously, in this story, God extends his life. Let's read a little bit about it. Isaiah chapter 38, starting in verse 5. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will add 15 years to your life. So with that, Hezekiah miraculously recovers. Well, the king of Babylon hears about Hezekiah's recovery, and he sends greetings to him and a gift to him. King Hezekiah then receives ambassadors from Babylon with open arms, and he invites them to come because they're allies against the Assyrians. And the Assyrians have been causing a huge amount of problem in that area of Mesopotamia in the Middle East. He gives them a tour then of the palace. He gives them a tour of the huge temple treasures. After they leave, Yeshayahu, Isaiah, came to Hezekiah and he gave him a very unpleasant prophecy. He says that, behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and all that your fathers have laid up in store to this day will be carried away to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your sons who will issue from you, whom you will beget, will be taken away. That comes from us, to us, from Isaiah chapter 39, verses six and seven. So immediately after hearing the story, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah then begins with a series of consolations and predictions about the return from exile. Interesting though, because in this section, Isaiah merges both the return from Babylon with the final return under King Mashiach, under King Messiah. It's extremely common, friends, that the prophets merge two things together often, both the current redemption and a future redemption in their prophetic lenses. So in this week's Torah portion, Lech Lecha, go forth in the Torah, Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 is being called by God to leave and to go forth, Lech Lecha, into the land of Canaan, of Canaan, into the land flowing with milk and honey, and for him to become a great nation. Let's read a little bit about it to put this in context. Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left as the Lord had told him. Now, from this story forward throughout the life of Abraham, he becomes known as the one who runs with God. That is so cool. See, wherever God tells him to go, he not only goes with God, but he runs with God. 
So in this accompanying Haftorah section, God tells the exiles of Israel he has not forgotten them and that their circumstances are his greatest of concerns and that he is going to redeem them. Just like under Pharaoh in Egypt, God is not going to allow little Israel to be consumed by the other nations. And then he tells Israel to take courage because he cares about them. He does not become weary or tired, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28. Well, let's read a little bit about this in Isaiah chapter 40, starting in verse 27. So why do you say, O Yaakov, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creators of the ends of the earth, and he will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on the wings of eagles. They will run and not grow weary, and they will walk and not become faint. You see, God reminds Israel that he has in fact chosen them. And because of his relationship with their illustrious father, Abraham, he will come to their rescue. Read about this in Isaiah chapter 41, verse eight. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, descendant of Abraham, my friend. I love that, that God is Abraham's friend. We know this, of course, but friends, are we also personifying that and, and making that practical for our own life, that God is not only the transcendent God of the universe, that he also is our friend. You see, those who place their trust in idols have no basis for any hope. Then to illustrate the point, the, the prophecy describes a craftsman making an idol in chapter 41, verses six and seven, and trying to keep it from toppling over. This is really great. Each helps the other and says to his brother, it says, be strong. The craftsman encourages the goldsmith and he who smooths with the hammer spurs on him who strikes the anvil. He says of the welding, it is good. He nails down the idol so it will not topple. Now, it seems silly to us today, but really it's pretty foolish to trust in the work of human hands when human hands are the work of God's hands. So Israel should place their confidence in the one who made all things, not place their trust in something made by human hands. This section of scripture is extremely practical for us today, specifically in America, but throughout the world. Americans are watching the president to see what he will enact to get us out of this financial mess, to get us out of the problems. Americans are watching Congress to see what they will enact to get us out of this health crisis that we're in, this global pandemic. Americans are watching the UN to see what they will enact to keep the world from another major war in the Middle East or around the world. But what we learn from scripture this week is that watching and waiting for the president, watching and waiting for the stock market, watching and waiting for Congress, watching and waiting for the nations, can never be a replacement for watching and waiting for God. Most commentaries tell us that the emphasis on this section of Isaiah is upon Israel being exiled to Babylon. But the rabbis who created the reading cycle chose Isaiah chapter 40 verses 27 through 41 verse 16 as the reading because of another reading and another reason all together. They chose it because of, wait for it, Abraham. Abraham, the father of our faith, both for the Jew and both for the Christian. So whether waiting for redemption in ancient Babylon or for waiting for redemption in modern America, friends, if there was ever a time, if there was ever a time to focus on our faith in God, it's absolutely, definitely, now, let's take a look at many connections that there are between this section of Isaiah pointing to having faith in God and the calling of Abraham, the man of faith in God. In our Torah portion, Genesis 17, we're told that Abraham was 99 years old when God said to him, 
Genesis chapter 17, verse 6. I will make you very fruitful. I will, underline that, mark that, circle it. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. And then to his wife, Sarah, who is some 90 year old uh, at this point in time, uh, God says in verse 16 of Genesis 17, I will bless her. I will, there it is again, surely give you a son by her. I will bless her that she so that she will be the mother of nations, kings of peoples will come from her. So then, likewise, in Isaiah, to those who are waiting in Babylon, God says this, Isaiah 40, verses 30 and 31. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will, there it is again, mark it, underline it, circle it, renew their strength, they will soar on wings like eagles, they will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not become faint. Now I want you to notice the tenses and the progression. They will, just like Abraham and Sarah, soar, run, walk. In other words, even at the very end of their lives, even at the time when you think that there is no future ahead, even when you think your body has completely worn out, your strength is all gone, you can no longer run, your hope is left, God will be there walking with you just like Abraham and Sarah. God will work a miracle. He did for them, He will for you, He will for us. Well, the reason that I think that Isaiah has Abraham in mind is because there are just way too many references to Abraham in this text. For example, in the Torah portion, at the very beginning of Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, God commands Avram, lech lecha, walk, go. Avraham is frequently described as one who walks or as one who runs in Hebrew. In Genesis 12, 6, Avram and his household depart to go to the land of Canaan. 12, 9, Avraham is described as journeying on, journeying steadily to the south. In 13.3, we find he went on his journeys. In 13.17, God says to Abraham, arise, walk about the land through its length and breadth, because I will give it to you. And even after Abraham is circumcised and he sees the three mysterious guests, I love that section, by the way, they were approaching and the text says in Genesis 18.2, and when he saw them, he ran toward them. And what does Isaiah say about those who are tired of waiting on things to change and are growing tired of waiting on a miracle and tired of waiting on God? Isaiah chapter 40, verse 30 run. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. In the Torah portion, we read that Avraham continues his journey which begin, uh, begins in the land of Ur of the Chaldeans, Genesis 12, 1, moving still eastward from Haran to the land of Canaan, Genesis 12, 5. In Genesis 12, 8, we read, from there he went on toward the hills east, he's moving east of Bethel, and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and the Ai on the east, and there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. In Isaiah we read, I want you to see the comparison here, Isaiah 41 too. Who has stirred up one from the, here it is, east, calling him in righteousness to his service. Mm, sounds like Abraham. He hands nations over to him, subdues kings before him. He turns them to dust with his sword, to windblown chaff with his bow. Hmm, sounds very familiar. In our Torah portion on Abraham, we read Genesis 14, 15. And Avraham pursued them to Chovah, that is to the left of Damascus. Who did Abraham pursue? He pursued the four major kings over the entire area. Now take a look and compare Isaiah, because we find in chapter 41, verses 2 and 3, he spread nations before him and ruled over kings. He turned them into the dust with his sword and to chaff with his bow. He pursued them and passed without harm. And in chapter 41, 12, we find, they that warred against you shall be as nothing. In the Torah, 
Genesis chapter 12, verses 7 and 8, it says, And God appeared to Avraham and said, To your seed will I give this land. And in 17, 8, he says, We find, I will give to you and to your seed after you the land. Well, now let's compare Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8, But you, O Israel, my servant, Yaakov, whom I have chosen, your descendants, there is that key word, of Abraham, uh, Abraham, my friend. Here, Yaakov, the inheritor of the land of Israel, is described as the seed of Abraham. In Genesis chapter 15, 1, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. In Isaiah, let's compare. 41.10 says, So do not fear. Sound familiar? For I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. In Isaiah chapter 41, verses 10, 13, 14, we have a repeated phrase, Ani Azartika, I will help you. I will help you. Ani Azartika. In Genesis, uh, Eliezer, he helps Abraham defeat the kings from the other nations. Eliezer in Hebrew means, my God helps me. Talk about linking Genesis and Isaiah together. You see, over and over again, God shows through the prophet Isaiah, it is only through faith in God that we're going to make it through tough times. It's only in our faith with God. It is through the example of Abraham that we find hope while in the midst of the unknown. And friends, the future is unknown with our earthly eyes, but it is very known and described and pinned out and ready for us in God's eyes. The prophet reminds us that in this life, it is only through faith that we'll find victory. And what better way to show that than through the person of Abraham, a man with nothing but a desire to know and to please God, who leaves that which is known to embrace the unknowable. Think about it. A man who released his grip on the material world of Mesopotamia to lay hold on the spiritual world of God. He was alone in a world of polytheism, and yet he determined to be a light to the nations for the one true God. You see, Abraham predated the Hebrew phrase in the Shema passage, Adonai Echad, the Lord is one, yet he was worshiping the one Lord. And look at Israel in Isaiah chapter 41, verses 13 and 14. For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear. That's a command, by the way. Do not fear, I will help you. Do not be afraid, O worm Jacob, O little Israel, for I myself will help you, declares the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Calling someone a worm in a, our culture <laughs> really is a very a demeaning uh, and a contemptual expression, but not in the language of the Bible. A worm symbolized lowliness and helplessness. The worm has no defenses. It's among the lowest of life forms. God compares Israel to a worm because like the worm, Israel in Babylon is small, helpless, and God says, I myself will help you. Because in verse 14, it says, God is their redeemer. I wanna finish uh, teaching this segment with a story about Abraham and his father, Terah, that's some 3,000 years old. It's been passed down from generation to generation to generation. It ends up in the pages of the Talmud, and it goes like this. Terah was an idol maker. On one occasion, he was embarking on a journey, so he left young Abraham to mine the idol shop in his absence. When a customer came to purchase an idol, Abraham asked him, how old are you? And the customer would answer that he was 50 or 60 years old. Woe to this man, Abraham would decry. He is 60 years old, yet he wants to prostrate himself before an idol only one day old. The customer would leave in shame. And once a woman entered the shop carrying a bowl of flour as a gift to the gods, take the flour and offer it before the idols for me, she told Abraham. 
He took a stick and he smashed all the idols except the biggest one. Then he placed the stick in the hand of the biggest idol. When his father returned, he asked, Who smashed the idols? Abraham replied, Why should I try to conceal the truth from you? A woman entered the shop with a bowl of flour and told me to offer to the idols. I placed it before them and one said, I will eat it first. Another said, I will eat it first. The biggest one took a stick, smashed the others. Why are you lying to me? Terah demanded. Do idols have intelligence? Abraham replied, Let your ears hear what your mouth is saying. Genesis Rabbah 38.8 Likewise, in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 7, we have the imagery of workers in a workshop making idols. And I'm absolutely positive Isaiah is thinking about Abraham. It says this, Isaiah chapter 41, verse 7, The craftsman encourages the goldsmith, and he who smooths with a hammer spurs on him who strikes the anvil. He says of the welding, it is good. He nails down the idol so it will not topple. Sound familiar? So we live in a generation of people who are looking to nail things down so they don't have a sense of uh, security in this world. They nail things down so that they will. They don't have a sense of security, friends. They want to nail things down. They want to nail down their, their thought of their paradigm of the world and where they stand amongst all things. Where, you know, we have these selfies all the time going on with people with their phones, taking pictures of themselves, posting them online, social media. Look at me doing this. Look at me doing this. Look at me eating my food. Why? Because people are looking for security and they're looking for something outside of themselves. And when they look inwardly, they find that there is no security with themselves. They realize they're finite. They're terminal beings and that they're in desperate need of meaning. And there's only meaning when we find God in our lives. How often, friends, do we look to our own resources for our sense of security? How often do we look at our own abilities to answer our cries for help? How often do we call upon a mere human for answers? But here God says that He is our help and He is our answer. In a world of idolatry, in a world of many gods, we can call upon the one true God, Adonai Echad, our Lord is one. Friends, this world needs answers. It needs answers. There's tons of religions around the world. There's tons of religions probably in your own neighborhood. People are looking for answers and they're not finding it unless they find it in the God of Israel. And they find it in the God of Israel's son, Yeshua the Messiah the one who came and he gave his life for us. He rose again from the grave and he's coming back to save those who call upon him. Friends, if there was ever a time to be bold in your faith, now is that time. Don't stand back. Don't just sit in the pew. Don't just pray. Yes, pray, but not just pray. Get up and do something more than praying. Pray and then go out and talk to your neighbors. Love on your family members. Let people know that there's hope. Let them know that there's answers. Let them know that there's more than just taking selfies of themselves. They need to turn around and realize the greatest selfie in the world was done by the Messiah who was the selfie of the invisible God. He's the image of the God who saves the universe for those who call upon him and call upon his name. As we're finishing up now with this episode of Lech Lecha, remember what the name means. It means to go forth and we are called like Abraham to go forth, to go forth to a, a world that is absolutely lost. They're looking for answers and not finding them. They, they thought they could trust their governments. They realize now these are just mortal men and women. They can't trust the governments. They can't trust health care. They can't trust their retirement funds. They can't trust their jobs. They can't trust their health. The only thing they can trust is what they cannot see. And this takes us all the way back to Genesis, where God cast them out, and now we have to go by faith in what we cannot see. There is a God. And this God has a perfect plan for you individually, a perfect plan for your life. I know it sounds like religion. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about relationship. 
God, the invisible God who created your DNA. He created the structure of your body. He created your mind. He created your heart. He created you to love, to care, and be a relational being. He loves you. And when you allow yourself to say, come into my heart and breathe your life in me, as you did in Adam and Eve, Chava, breathe your life in me and let me live your life through the rest of my days. Then you will find meaning. Then you will find purpose and you will find life. Until next time, Shalom. 